Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast with Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. During this program, you will hear interviews with real-life successful investors who will share their stories and provide useful advice on how to acquire, finance, and operate apartment complexes. Now, here they are, Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, National Underwriter for Old Capital, and joining me today is Michael Becker. Hey, Paul. You're not doing a due diligence? <laughs> How much you caught me for a change? <laughs> so we're in the Old Capital Podcast studios, and, and with us today is a friend of ours that last time we had him on, I think it was March of, yeah. of this year. And so he is a wealth of information, as I say. He is the guy that the decision makers listen to, whether they're building apartments or they're lending on apartments or they're going to invest in apartments. The guy I'm talking about is a friend of our, our podcast, and we, we put a lot of faith in what he says, not just in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but across the country. So we have Greg Willett. So Greg, thanks for being on the podcast. We do appreciate that. Great to be joining you again today, guys, and we appreciate the opportunity. So I'm going to kick it over to Mike and let's get going. Yeah. So if anyone is listening to this and you haven't listened to the the recording six or seven months ago, please go do that. But Greg, maybe to give everyone a refresher, you can kind of go through your background, tell us a little about who you are and why we're talking to you today. Great. My name is Greg Willett. I'm the chief economist for RealPage. uh, And RealPage is a technology and data analytics firm focused on real estate and particularly in the multifamily space. We provide technology products that are used by somewhere around 12 million rental units across the country, as well as in several markets internationally. That's good. And you're based here in Richardson, Texas, and that's where we're recording the podcast. And last time we're talking to you guys, we're just in the midst of uh, acquiring Axiometrics, the largest competitor, and maybe talk a little bit about that and kind of the integration of the last seven or eight months of the two companies. So it's an opportunity for us to put together two really interesting data sets. What we really like about the Axiometrics data set is the granularity and the individual property information and the frequency of data collection. Looking at what we had already at RealPage, it was a little bit larger data set that we were starting with and that we were tracking more properties and particularly more Class B and Class C properties. And then also we've got a lot of lease transaction information that you can collect from these technology systems. So we think put that all together and it's a database that really can't be beat. So you have about 12 million rental units you say you uh, you track that on? Well, 12 million rental units are using some sort oh. of real page oh. product. Yeah. In terms of what we're tracking on day-to-day activity, the database is not quite that that large, that large but big. It's a big database. Got it. So, so maybe what we kind of started with is uh, you, you track all the, the major metros across the entire country. Uh, maybe you kind of just give a quick little state of the market as you see as a country as a whole. What's going on in the U.S. multifamily market at a macro level? We certainly view the U.S. apartment market as healthy, although we have certainly slowed down from the momentum that was seen a year or two ago. And particularly on the rent growth side, we've seen some slowdown. We were at the max in late 2015 having annual rent growth that was above 5%. The U.S. number is, let's just call it around 2.5% at this point, but still a, a very solid occupancy performance. And that's impressive when you consider how much we've ramped up new supply and and our ability to digest product uh, that's coming online right now is pretty impressive. Is there any sort of common themes you see uh, across the across the country? Is it just most of the new supply being delivered in the urban core or any sort of uh, common trends across uh, many metros? Something we certainly see in market after market is a really heavy flow of new product in those urban core settings. It's not a majority of the product in most metros, but it's two to three times what would be the urban core's share in previous cycles. So a lot of high-end product coming on, 
a lot of it in the urban core and just really expensive units, even if it's in suburban settings. This new product is really expensive. And that's where the softest is generally concentrated? Is that accurate? But certainly we've seen that the first cool off has been at this top of the market product and particularly top of the market urban core. We've seen rent growth slow down a little bit in B and C product from where it was, but still pretty healthy numbers nationally in those segments. That's good. We, we do a lot of business in Texas and talk about Texas a lot, but is there any other markets around the country that kind of stand out for either being, I guess, on the on the good ledger or the bad side of the ledger? In your opinion, what, what are some of the better or the, the worst markets around around the country? Certainly, we're looking at, at top. A lot of the top tier performers actually now are, are emerging in these secondary and tertiary markets. And some of the core high profile markets, which are thought of as the big barrier to entry markets, apparently the barriers aren't quite what we thought they were <laughs> because they're actually getting lots of new supply relative to what is typical in those markets. And so, some of those really high profile markets, I mean, the, the sexy six that people like to talk about on the coast, those have slowed down some. So that would be like San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles. So sexy six, yeah, that be, would be New York, Boston, D.C., L.A., Bay Area, and Seattle. Okay, got it. So kind of moving to Texas, what do you see as a whole for the state of Texas? And then maybe we kind of go through the four major metros here. So do you have any sort of kind of just macro comments about Texas and the – the economy as it relates to apartments? I would say that what I talked about in terms of the national trends, we tend to be seeing that in the Texas markets as well, that we've had some slowdown from where we were, but where we were was record levels. And so as I think of the big markets across the state now, you see that same sort of pattern in Dallas-Fort Worth, in Austin, and in San Antonio. Obviously, Houston is its own separate story, which reflects both its unique economy and what's happened with the hurricane. So, well, maybe we we'll start there. What, what, tell us a little bit about Houston. So, kind of going in the first part of this year, we're talking to you. There was quite a bit of a glut of supply that was already delivered and some some kind of supply being finished to deliver. Couple of that with a uh, slow economy due to the recession in oil prices. We had, uh, you know, elevated vacancies, concessions, a market that's a little bit out of balance. And so then we've had the hurricane happen in September or August. So what, what's happened in Houston uh, ever since then? As you said, Houston was struggling earlier in the year, although the economy was starting to improve at that point, And we were getting back into pretty decent job growth. But at the same time, a lot was coming on stream. So since the hurricane, we've had a little bit of multifamily product taken offline, but the bigger impact is really just some people that have been displaced from single family homes. And so we've had two or three months of just really huge demand and particularly in those new communities that were moving through initial lease up in the two months after the hurricane. Close to 5,000 units were absorbed just in those properties. So in turn, we've seen concessions. There are still some concessions, but certainly not as frequent or as deep as they were earlier. And then that annual rent change number, we've gone from we were slightly negative pre-hurricane. The first month after the hurricane, we were slightly positive. And then the latest day that we have is what happened in the month of October, and we were at a about 3% annual rent growth in Houston. So some momentum coming back pretty quickly in that one. In your estimation, is that going to be sustainable or is that just a temporary blip when, when these houses, a lot of these houses come back online? Are these people going to move back and then go away? Certainly there is some danger that we've signed a bunch of short-term leases and you're mm-hmm. going to lose some of these households. But then at the same time, the amount of product that we're delivering next year is pretty small in Houston. We wrap up almost all the construction in in the next few months, and we're now looking at an economy that's gone from basically no growth to pre-hurricane. It was annual growth of close to 50,000 jobs, and the expectation next year is for 70,000 plus jobs in Houston. So yes, you might lose that few of these displaced people going back to their homes, but 
overall, we're looking at a really solid performance for Houston for the next couple of years. So, so you're pretty bullish going forward? We are. We think that at a minimum, we maintain the rent growth that we've got right now and, in fact, could get a little bit stronger. Okay, cool. Well, maybe we can – Paul? I'm just wondering, out of the displaced people, how many were – in the A class and how many were in the B class and how many are in the C class because my impression is a lot of the South East Houston was hit and that's a lot of older product. Well, certainly as we see the data that we can look at, I mean, the area that got really messed up in terms of some units went offline and also a whole lot of people in these neighborhoods got displaced whether they were in single family homes or, or other product. It was right around those reservoirs where they had to open the dams briefly to keep the water from cresting over the top there. So that's really southwest Houston as you get out, move out toward Katy was the really impacted area. Got it. So maybe we can move over to San Antonio next. Last time we were talking, you thought San Antonio was doing okay. It was definitely slowing down. And uh, the top of the market, you were saying, was doing better than the lower end of the market. Is that still the case, or what, what's going on in San Antonio the last uh, six, seven months? We, we're continuing to see some slowdown in the overall performance. Occupancy is okay. What I would tend to think of as sort of the bottom of the typical range in that market, but we're losing pricing power in, in San Antonio. And overall, Annual rent growth is only about 1% at this point. And again, it's an, an anomaly across the country in that really the top end product is doing better than that middle to bottom tier in this one. Do you have a sense of why that is in uh, San Antonio? I think it's it's partly the nature of the economy. I mean, to the degree that we are producing jobs, they tend to be jobs in categories where the folks can afford the better quality product and you just get a lot of churn in the resident base yeah. in San Antonio and the BNC sort of product and that's true in any metro where tourism or hospitality is an outsized portion of the total economy and okay. so really as we look at big markets across the country San Antonio has more renter churn than anywhere else okay mm. huh I never thought of that when I think of San Antonio. I always thought it was pretty stable with the military and the uh, kind of the permanent base that you have of employment. It's pretty steady in the overall performance of the apartment market, but people just move around a lot yeah. from one property to another. Okay, cool. And then moving to, to Austin, we saw you speak a week ago at the Marcus and Millichap Forum here in Dallas, and you were talking about how Austin's definitely slowed down from from a few years ago. But the northern suburbs are where kind of more of the softness was and it was a little bit performing a little bit better in the urban core, which was a little bit of a, a surprise looking at the data to me at least. So maybe talk about Austin and, and what's going on there. Sort of backing up to that overall story that I've been telling of, of a little bit of slowdown, some of that is related to the volume of new supply that we're seeing in market after market. Another part of it is a little bit of a slowdown in economic growth in most places. The slowdown in job formation in Austin has been more pronounced than it has been in other spots across the state and across the country. And right now, while we're producing jobs at an okay level, it's only about half of where we were a couple of years ago. And so that has slowed down the demand and we're just not absorbing a whole lot of units at this point. So in these spots where we're delivering a lot of new supply, you're starting to see some struggles emerge in Austin and particularly at the top end of the market in Austin. And that new supply is actually coming on in the suburban environment in Austin and not so much in the urban core. We did go through a wave of completions in the urban core, but we've pretty much finished that at this point. And there's just not much more under construction downtown. Have you seen very much condo conversions? Anything going from apartments to condos? I would say that my count at this point is zero, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to say I'm not missing one or something, but no, certainly not going in that direction. There are a handful of purpose-built condos coming yeah. online in Austin, but I've not seen anything converted. 
do you see 2018 kind of rebounding a little bit in the northern suburbs, or is this going to be something that we're going to see for the next you know year or two? Yeah, I think this is one where Austin's going to be pretty soft in the in the coming year, and and it might do a little bit better than it is right now. But where we're coming from is as of third quarter. Overall, we were, again, at only about 1% rent growth in Austin. And as we look at the latest monthly number for October, the annual change actually went slightly negative in this one. So so we think very mild rent growth over the next year or two in Austin while we wrap up what's still under construction in this one. What, what about kind of the lower quality, the B and the C product? Is that still going to be flat to very minimal growth or is that going to outperform the top of the market, do you feel? It could outperform the top of the market a little bit. But again, part of the story in Austin, it's not just a supply story. It's that significant slowdown employment. in the in employment growth. And that impacts really all across the entire product spectrum. So we're not negative on rent change in BNC product, but we're only slightly positive. Got it. So before you get into Dallas and Fort Worth, how about some of these secondary and tertiary markets? Anything that you like out there? Uh, certainly we're seeing that the secondary and tertiary markets across the state are doing pretty well. Something we have to watch for is they've been late in the cycle to attract construction. So now we're getting to the point where over the next couple of years, we might have some more deliveries starting to come online. And those, the one I would, secondary market I would, I would highlight for the state is West Texas is suddenly booming again with what's happening in the energy sector. And so Midland Odessa rent growth is now 20% plus on an annual basis. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're just trying to recapture what you gave away yeah. over the last couple of years, but suddenly that one is on fire again. Yeah. Well, that, that's interesting because financing in West Texas is still very tough. Hey, what do you think about the energy sector moving ahead? I mean, is the question you have to ask, is mm-hmm. this really sustainable? But for right now, these West Texas apartments are full again, and you're getting really big price increases. How about up and down the 35 corridor, all the way from Sherman Denison, all the way to Waco, all the way down to Laredo? Is that kind of the growth pattern that you continue to see? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly very, very solid numbers. And, you know, you're going to have blips from time to time. But those are the economies that you have real confidence in moving ahead. Yeah, that's good. So we've actually seen quite a few transactions, I think, Paul, in Waco, which seems to be one of the markets that we've been uh, doing a little bit more business in at Old Capital lately. So uh, I don't know if it's a whole Magnolia effect or what's going I on. I was going to say, we're about to shut down Fixer Upper. <laughs> Does that continue then? Uh, who knows? Who knows? So They were uh, saying that more people go to Waco to see Magnolia than to the Alamo. The Alamo. I saw that headline this week, <laughs> which I, I, I was like, okay, I believe it, but- it's a destination it's, resort there we go. area. That's nuts. So, uh, <laughs> so moving into Dallas Fort Worth, where we're, we're based, and we do you know majority of the transactions here. So, what's your kind of general take on the DFW as a, as a whole? And then maybe talk about the two different sides of the Dallas side and the Fort Worth side of the market, and how they performance and and kind of future performance differ. Let's start with the overall economy, which you know we you read the headlines, boy, we add a lot of jobs in Dallas Fort Worth. It's still impressive, but even in this one following that pattern that we've seen elsewhere. While we're adding jobs at an annual pace of 90,000 or so, earlier in the year we were at 135,000. So we are seeing some slowdown in the economic growth pace here in Dallas-Fort Worth that is impacting demand numbers a little bit. So we're, and we're delivering a lot of supply. So we're starting to lose momentum a little bit, but particularly on the pricing. Point. Pricing, so occupancy stayed pretty steady. Uh, occupancy, we're still running around that 95% mark, even with so much in initial lease up. I mean, we're beginning to trickle down a little bit, but I don't think anybody's going to complain about 94, 95% occupancy in Dallas Fort Worth. It's really that rent growth question. Have we seen any sectors in particular of employment slow up versus, you know, what we've seen last, you know, four or five years? It's a pattern that you're sort of seeing all across the country that it's just kind of a general slowdown more than it is sector related. And, and really, as much as anything, it ties to 
demographics, just simply the fact that you've got um, the oldest baby boomers are hitting retirement age. And so while you're adding a whole lot of young people into the employment mix and the labor pool, at the same time, you're actually starting to subtract people on the opposite end of the spectrum. And that wasn't a big factor up until yeah. the last couple of years. Got it. So so speaking of uh, the two sides, so tell us a little bit, what, what do you see on the Dallas side and what do you see on the Fort Worth side? Certainly the construction activity is very heavy on the Dallas side. And so that means we've seen more of a slowdown in rent growth for Dallas than in Fort Worth. The overall number for DFW on annual rent growth now is running around 3%. But on the Dallas side, we're a hair under 2% versus Fort Worth, you're still at 4% plus. Mm -hmm. And here's an interesting trivia point for you. We recently did some analysis where we were talking about Seattle, and, and one of our points there was it's had the longest streak of outperforming the U.S. as a whole for rent growth. Second on that list is actually Fort Worth. We're at something like Five full years where Fort Worth has had rent growth above the U.S. average, yeah. and it's still very comfortably above the U.S. average yeah. right now. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So so as far as last time we're on, I think you said there's about 50,000 units either under construction or in the, in the pipeline. 42,000 of those were on the Dallas side, about 8,000 on the Fort Worth side. Have those numbers changed materially from, from six, seven months ago? We finally reached a point where we're not quite starting as many units as we mm. finished. So the, the amount under construction, which peaked at 52, 53,000 units now is at something like 46, 47,000 units. I mean, that's still a lot. That's still a huge amount, but we are starting to trend down a little bit. What's coming online is still very Dallas focused, but as I talk about it slowing down, it's slowing down on the Dallas side versus yeah. Fort Worth is steady to actually a little bit of a trend upward in, in starts. And do you feel like they still have enough demand and economic activity to absorb all those units on the on the Fort Worth side? Yeah, I mean, we're pretty confident uh, of Fort Worth moving forward. We, we think, again, it's outperforming Dallas a little bit now over the next year. That probably is going to be even more pronounced. Mm -hmm. So pretty confident in Fort Worth as we move ahead. A little bit more of a struggle, at least in pockets on the Dallas side. Yeah. As far as uh, kind of going through like the quality of, of products, so as far as like how the A product, B product, C products kind of differentiate versus each other and how their performance, can you maybe talk through? It sounds like the top of the market's where the softness is. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the competitive part of the marketplace. It's interesting as we look at the overall occupancy number. And again, in, in Dallas-Fort Worth overall now, it's about 95%. The reason it's staying so strong, despite all this new supply, is the incredibly tight occupancy that you're getting in particularly Class C properties, which there's over the long term been a trend of pretty meaningful vacancy in Dallas-Fort Worth in that Class C product. But those properties are just jam-packed full. Uh, including in some neighbors, which are, I mean, if we're being honest, are not especially desirable. Boy, those units are full at this point. What do you see? That's always been a concern of mine that, you know, being in the market my entire life and then, you know, being around around the block a time or two and you see kind of the last cycle, of these, these pockets like Lake Highlands and Vickery Meadows and South Dallas and East Fort Worth, some of the tougher socioeconomic areas of, of town have 80, 80, 85% occupancy in the worst of times with a month or two concessions and you get all these skips and all these uh, these other issues with them are all now 95% and the pricing of these deals have gone you know through the roof and our companies personally not participated in any of that. Those are sub-markets we've been trying to stay away. But uh, everyone that's there has made a fortune because all these, these, these places are full. Do you see as that as a potential risk going forward or what, what kind of risk, what do you see of risk in market as a whole or in, in DFW specifically? I think maybe it's more insulated than it has been in the past simply because through the course of the cycle, we have pushed up rents so much overall that you really do have some people who've been priced out of B product and, and C is really all they can afford at this point. But there there's obviously still some risk in that if you, for whatever reason, have an overall economic stumble, 
this is the segment of the population that really gets hit in that situation, and there's no cushion there at all. I mean, they don't have any savings. There's no way for them to deal with just any minor problem. Yeah, that's kind of like bankers think is that when the market gets soft, those are some of the areas that we don't want to have exposure to. You know, I remember last time and the time before and the time before that in terms of these cycles, you know, some of these, these areas are, have, you know, 85, 90,000, $95,000 a unit cost to them, where seven, eight years ago they were 18,000 or 20,000. So maybe I just have a, a bad memory that some of these people that from outside the area don't remember. So, uh, hey, I'm with you. I've seen multiple cycles. That segment makes me nervous in the way that we have run up the pricing there. But at the same time, I can make a case for why that's still okay. That's what I like about lending. It's easy to give the money out. The tough thing is getting the money back. So I like to get the money back in lending. So you know, whether you say it or not, I mean, that those, those areas sometimes can be very difficult. Is there any particular submarkets while we're still kind of wrapping up DFW here that, that you really like as far as like uh, particular submarkets in town that you think are going to perform pretty well in 2018? I think it's easier to point to the ones that are probably going to struggle okay. and that, you know, that that is these urban core area and particularly all the high rise product coming in the online in the urban core. I mean, that's one area. The other one is whenever, even though we're just adding so many jobs in these northern suburbs, we've got so much product under construction in Frisco and Allen and McKinney that you have some concern about those. It's interesting now that we are starting to spread out the construction a little bit, though, and that we're starting to hit some areas where we haven't really built to date. So the most recent chart I did where I was listing the 10 most active submarkets for building. I can't remember the last time Garland was on yeah. the list. And it actually w- it was in the number 10 spot in this this latest one. So I think if we're going to build 50,000 units, I want us to build a few of those in Garland and some of these secondary sort of submarkets. Mm-hmm. I don't want it all to be downtown and Frisco. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, Garland is probably an affordable housing area. But going back to your urban core, you know, people take out leases for a year or so. And at that higher end with these big podium style, big apartment tall buildings, how long are these, these tenants usually in the unit itself? Are they there for 18 months? Are they there for 24 months? And how sensitive on that upper side of the, the rents are they of trying to boost rents up? Are they the first ones out the door on the A side? Or do they, do they stay there very long? Because I know in the B and C, they can typically stay there a longer right. period of time. Well, a couple of observations I would have for you would be the people who end up living in this urban core luxury to super luxury product, they are not stretching to afford that at all. I mean, their their rent to income ratios are really low compared to what you see in the rest of the marketplace. That means that they're, you know, I mean, they, it's the ultimate renter by choice segment, and obviously they can change their mind. They don't really, from our perspective, have a tendency to move around more than other folks do. But in the urban core setting, there is a little bit higher turnover than you see in the suburbs. And that's partly, from our perspective, more so tied to the number of young adults that you get in that setting. And then young adults just change jobs more frequently. They change household composition more frequently. So these things that tend to spur you to move, it just happens more in the urban core than it does in the suburban settings. So kind of switching gears on you a little bit, we're we're almost at Thanksgiving as we record this podcast. And uh, one of the big hot topics lately has been tax reform. Or I don't know if you want to call it reform, but the the changes in the tax code that are kind of coming out, and uh, everything that I I've read about it, which I haven't I haven't studied it too closely, it seems like it couldn't have been written more perfectly for a uh, 
an apartment investor, specifically one based out of, you know, not California or New York, essentially, and that the, the, the tax reform laws are going to benefit commercial real estate and specifically and uh, punish kind of the, the coastal states. Do you have any sort of opinions from what you read on, on how that's going to impact the uh, economy in the, in the apartment market? Well, what I would say, just as the, the first point is, I don't have a crystal ball more than anybody else does here. I mean, I don't really know what is going to get through there. Number one, what I would say is just anything getting approved actually is probably a good thing, even if it's not what we want to see happen. Mm-hmm. Just Congress actually got it together and got something through the system that is generally perceived as something that will provide at least a temporary bump and for the overall economy and boost the job gain numbers a little bit. So that's good for just housing demand overall. Some of the specifics that are in the the proposals that we see now, I mean, it's pretty favorable for rental housing. Folks don't love the current proposals on carried interest, and they don't love the current proposals on the 1031 exchange program, but we'll see. I mean, overall, it probably is net beneficial to the multifamily side of the world. That's good. The other big headline here in, in Dallas is everyone uh, thinks Amazon HQ2 is is coming here because a recent article in the Wall Street Journal uh, picked Dallas as a favorite. Do you have any thoughts about where that's going to go? It seems like the biggest contenders are you know Atlanta, DC, maybe Dallas, maybe Austin. Do you have any thoughts on on that and the potential impact to that that market it ultimately goes to for its uh, apartment stock? I'm out and about in the world all the time doing industry events, going and seeing clients. I I will say that. If you just look at the local media, every single place across the country is completely sure that they're the, <laughs> the, the number one spot there. And everybody who has put out a, a list on that in theory is evaluating these markets based mm-hmm. on the criteria that Amazon said comes up with a different list on where it's going to be. I think you can make a strong case for Dallas-Fort Worth, but... I'm not the decider. Sure. Yeah. Do you do you, you don't you don't have an opinion? It sounds like where where you think it's going to go. No, I don't really know. But I'll point out that a market like Dallas Fort Worth, which is really big and really fast growing already, does it change anything in the big picture if it is Dallas Fort Worth? Yeah. And and I would say not much. Obviously, it changes things for whatever neighborhood you end up in, but will metro level numbers move very much due to this? I don't think so. But on the other hand, you go to a more mid-sized city, and I'll just throw out some examples of, of ones that have been on some of those lists. I mean, if, if, it, if it were to end up being a Nashville mm-hmm. or somewhere of that size that is meaningfully smaller than Dallas Fort Worth, then yeah, that is a big deal. There was one list that had upstate New York as a top five choice. If it ended up going there, life is completely different. Right. <laughs> Who would work there, though, I guess is the question. But, but I don't know <laughs> that we're actually going to see people lined up to move to Buffalo. New- yeah, exactly. <laughs> Got it. So kind of maybe maybe looking forward a little bit. Do you have any predictions kind of going forward? What do you guys see for 2018 as a whole? Kind of, I guess, just nationally and then maybe maybe talk about Texas and Dallas-Fort Worth. What do, you, what do you see 2018 to be on looking like? Are we still pretty healthy in the foreseeable future? Are there clouds, storm clouds on the horizon? What, what, what's Greg Willett's uh, crystal ball say? Well, our overall position, both nationally and in most of the Texas markets, is pretty much more of the same. I mean, we don't see a lot of, of shifts there in terms of overall apartment occupancy and the overall rent growth numbers. What I think is actually the number to watch as we go in this to this next year or two is the construction starts mm-hmm. number. And our anticipation is that we're going to be again to slow that down pretty meaningfully. And if we do that, then, you know, we look pretty solid in the cycle for extending it for several more years. I mean, honestly, if we don't slow down construction in, in the next couple of years, I think we're talking about how quickly does this cycle end. Okay. So construction is your key, your key benefit. I, that's, that's the one that I, w- I would really be looking at. 
Was there anything so far this year in 2017 that were, you know, almost at the end of 2017 that caught you off guard that you were thinking was going to happen that didn't happen or anything that was a little bit more uh, more pronounced than you thought it would be? Well, obviously, we were exactly right in all of our <laughs> forecasting. Well, I would have to say that, that big picture, I mean, nothing really emerged that was super shocking. Uh, and just as, as for, you know, the coming year, I'm, pr- I'm predicting more of the same. If you'd asked me that a year ago, that would have was, was my answer for this coming year, kind of more of the same, and really not a whole lot did change in 2017. So besides construction, is there anything that you would see kind of as top risk for, you know, we're an expansion cycle since, what, 20, 2010, 2011? It's a so really long, really long time. Would you see anything, you know, as a macro economy that, that kind of has you a little concerned, or what do you, what do you think would trigger – the next recession or most likely to trigger the next recession in, in your uh, your estimation? So, I mean, the real danger is this black swan event. And by definition, then you can't identify what that is. Really, economists all across the country don't tend to not see anything that's a real concern. You over and over get that quote that a, a cycle doesn't die of old age. But I will point out this one's gone on for apartments, gone on long enough that, you know, we've really driven up pricing. And so are we at the point where even though the overall big picture numbers look look very favorable, can you find the individual deals that work financially now? I mean, that's just the real challenge. Yeah. Yeah. One, one thing I've seen, I've heard, go to several conferences, is just basically the most likely thing to trigger it from what I've heard is just the yield curve inverting where the the short-term rates go quicker than the long-term rates do. And then, you know, usually when that happens, you got 12, 18 months, uh, hold your hat, and then we hit a recession. So, I don't know, Paul, do you have anything to add? Nothing on that, but I, you know, we do a lot of business in the B&C sector, and I want to kind of figure out kind of your top three or four markets outside of Texas that you see some opportunity in. You know, I mean, we really like Texas. And so the way I would kind of look at this is what are the markets that are the most Texas-like? And what for us really jumps out as we think of the junior version of Texas is the Carolinas and Tennessee. So places like Charlotte and Raleigh and and Nashville, we think are are good long-term plays. And they kind of overlooked, but the Midwest, you're never going to hit a home run in the Midwest, but it's also hard to mess up. Mm Mm-hmm. What do, you, what do you think of uh, one of the markets that's caught my eye recently, Salt Lake City in Utah? What do you think of that market? Do you have an opinion on Utah and Salt Lake City? We, we certainly like that one. I, I mean, if you're thinking of it, compare it to uh, Texas markets, it's very Austin-like. Mm-hmm. So you you do have the danger of, as you see in Austin right now, if the economy slows down, then you have some challenges. And then there are times where it's a pretty significant building market so you can get over your skis a little bit at points there but yeah big picture we certainly like that one one thing i would point out about that one relative to texas markets it's pretty single family home focused the apartment sector is a is a smaller share of the total housing base so you guys are really a technology company but you know have twelve thousand touch points so you guys can really slice and dice the amount of data that comes into your, as I say, black box. How about a- He said clear box last Yeah, you know, I, you know I object to that black box <laughs> phrasing, Paul. <laughs> but uh, how about amenities on the, some of these properties? I mean, we kind of know what the amenities are on some of these Class A properties. But anything you've seen in the Class B or C properties for amenities? Just in terms of, of that value add play and what – get some traction there. I mean, more than anything, the important thing is just make it visible. I mean, it's just something you can glance at the unit and you can see that you did some sort of upgrade. And then I think uh, just a really underrated upgrade is just exterior appearance and curb appeal. I mean, that really does get you some traction. Anything that you're working on, Mike? That uh... Uh, so we've been doing these for about a year, but the package locker systems have been, you know, increasingly more and more popular, and it really is. Uh, we're we're coming up to the, the package season with the holidays coming up. That's been, you know, certainly a, a big amenity that we've been adding to most of these units, and then going on for a few years, just adding the extended private patios, the backyards. 
those are nice amenities because everyone uh, everyone has a freaking dog anymore. So, you know, having a nice little area for your dog, that has certainly been a very attractive thing to a prospective tenant. So anything pet friendly seems to be the, what's been going on for multiple years and I don't see anything slowing that up. No, I, d- I definitely agree with that. Anything that we need to talk about that we haven't talked about, Greg, that you want to share with us? I, I You know, I think we've hit high points there. Perfect. So, well, well, Greg, we definitely appreciate you coming on the podcast. Paul, what's going on in the old capital world? Anything new? Our speaker series is going to kick out probably in late January, starting in February. We'll probably have Greg out to do a presentation to the group. We usually have two, 300 people that come out to that event. So we'll let you know when that's going to be available. And don't forget that if you do like the podcast, please give us a five-star rating on iTunes or Stitcher. We do appreciate that. So we kind of call ourselves apartment nerds. You may be fans of multifamily ownership, but we definitely are big, big fans. And that if you think somebody should listen to our podcast, we appreciate maybe you uh, just telling a friend about them. Perfect. Well, th- thanks so much, uh, Greg. We definitely appreciate you uh, you coming on. Yeah, we, we do appreciate uh, Greg coming on. He is a wealth of information. And if you're looking for additional information, don't forget about the 15-page white paper report on multifamily financing. Michael also has a due diligence report in yeah, there, too. Yeah, sample due diligence checklists in there as well. That people really have, have found uh, very useful. So, again, uh, Michael Becker, we appreciate it. Uh, Greg Willett, always a pleasure. Thanks for your time. Don't forget uh, Real Page. We're a big supporter of, of uh, their company. 5,000 employees now, 6,000? How many people do you uh, have? We're, bet- we're between five and 6,000, yeah. A big company, <laughs> big company. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Greg. I'm Paul Peebles. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at oldcapitalpodcast.com to sign up for our weekly email updates. We'll see you next week for another great interview.